want to know what the movers and shakers of New Hampshire's performing arts are thinking? Welcome to New Hampshire Unscripted with your host, Ray Dudley. So I'm going to back up. You are somebody who I have been told repeatedly should appear as a guest. You. I'm honored. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's a blessing or a curse for you. But okay. uh, we're going to find out today. Yeah. Um, I don't know. You have some wealth of knowledge that everybody seems to say. You got to mind this guy. You got to. You got to talk to him. He knows where all the bodies are. So. Yeah. I'll give you a few. Of them. Find out what the boys. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me on. I no problem. It. No problem. So why don't we start with the basics? Um, full name, <clears throat> where you work, what you do, that kind of stuff, and then we'll just yeah. milk it from there. Well, I'm Matt Newton. I'm the bureau chief for film and digital media, and uh, that's uh, the bureau is located within travel and tourism in the Department of Business and Economic Affairs. Um, it is today. It's it's been bounced around uh, over the years. I've been doing state government for almost 17 years now, and I've uh, been involved with the film office um, since the start, uh, more of a part-time capacity. I actually started in tourism, believe it or not. It's, it's all come full circle. And the film office was over in tourism back in uh, 98 up until about 2004. And uh, I came on board about 2002, <coughs> and I was working sort of a half position, um, part-time with the film office, which is what I wanted to do, and half the time with tourism and their duties. And then the film office got moved over to the Department of Cultural Resources. Um, and then soon after that, I was brought on over there as, as director. That was 2005. So I've been heading up that film office ever since 2005. Okay. So it's been a lot of time. So it, it's interesting to me that it falls under the tourism. <coughs> excuse me. Falls under the tourism heading, um, and I'm guessing there's a reason for that. I mean, no other theater doesn't, and uh, performing arts for the most part are not. Um, I had Virginia Lupi in here uh, a couple of weeks ago. They're separate. They're not really under that umbrella either. How does that happen? How the um. Most of my counterparts in other states, and, and there's usually a film office either at the state level or regionally um, in every state around the, around the country. There are a few exceptions, but uh, most of them fall under travel and tourism uh, or economic development. Um, travel and tourism actually falls under economic development, the department Got you. here. So it, it just it makes sense. What I do in at the film office primarily. Um, in many respects is what tourism does. They, they, they market the state for visitors to get them to come to the state, get them to spend their money here, stay in our hotels, eat at our restaurants, um, and then they leave and having dropped a bunch of cash here. I do the same thing, except it's very tailored for the entertainment industry. Those are my visitors. Mm -hmm. Those are the folks that I'm trying to get here. Um, at the same token, it's not, it's not just about the economic development. It's, it's, it's about building an infrastructure here locally that can sustain some sort of a film industry, a, a television, a digital, now digital media. Um, and so my job is to work with local filmmakers and uh, organizations in our communities so they know how to host productions, um, best practices, what happens when things come up, issues come up. I act as a buffer many times between productions and communities. And, and so I guess when you all circle back, it, it, it's all about economic development because those productions will spend money here and businesses profit from that. So we're all working towards the same end. Um, it's, it's just interesting. Over the years, we've been trying to figure out exactly where that office belongs. And um, most recently, um, we felt that, you know, maybe we should, now that certain departments were breaking apart and, and reorganizing and realigning, maybe this was an opportunity to bring the film office back over to the economic development side and uh, into travel and tourism. So that's where we are today. Ask me again five years from now. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. <laughs> we'll see. <clears throat> now, it's changed, right, over the years. Is it, what is its basic scope? 
Is it to attract filmmaking? Is it to assist filmmakers? I have to tell you, I went onto your website. Mm-hmm. Dude, it's weak. It, it's nothing but a database, basically. It just has a database of crew and database of sites that you might want to... Yeah. So w- I, I couldn't really get a feel for what the Bureau does. Well, you know, in defense of that, it's, like I said, it, it was a recent transition. So at, at this point, it's just kind of getting myself onto that website, getting the Bureau there, gotcha. getting the basic So you structure. needed a presence. Yeah, I needed a presence and, and the basic things that all productions are seeking, which is just sort of the basic, you know, questions and answers about shooting in New Hampshire. Right. A database of crew and a database of locations. Those those are the primary things that all productions are going to be asking me about um, and are usually the first questions that I'll get from a production. The scope of it, I, I think you have to kind of look back over history because it's, it's definitely changed. It's film offices came into existence w- going way back into like the golden age of movies. You know, when when movies started getting out of Hollywood and going on locations, um, that was a very, very big deal back then because of the size of the equipment and the amount of people involved in production. It, it wasn't as easy as it is today. So going to a foreign area, whether you're in another country or just in the neighboring state, you do not have the lay of the land. Mm. You're, you're not as familiar with it. So film commissions were born to assist that there would be a point person in that state who could say you're looking for mountainscapes i've got their mountainscapes for you you're looking for a desert location you got to come over to this one you know that kind of thing and i really think that stemmed out of a lot of the cowboy movies that were being made and heading out west and, and going to the desert lands and there were people on the ground in arizona and utah that really knew the lay of the land so they could assist those productions and get them what they needed that evolved and over the decades it was really about location it was about we have a movie uh, it either takes place or there's something in the story that involves this location the state or wherever it is the city Uh, we're going to go there we're going to be authentic and we need you to help us get there today and i'm sure we'll talk more about this it's not so much about the the location as it is the financial incentive for the production. Um, it's, I would say we're at the, uh, the verge of a bubble bursting, though. Uh, I, I'm seeing it go the other way. Producers and location managers are really starting to get interested again in location. Oh, and, interesting. In the looks. So we may be seeing another shift here, but um, that's, that's sort of how film commissions evolved. And with the advent of film incentives, everybody began to compete. And that that all started with Canada. You know, everybody was, there was a financial incentive in Canada. Production started to move up there. So the states were like, well, how can we bring production back? And so they developed the same sort of financial incentives. And so states mirrored other states, so on and so forth. And now we've sort of like dropped to the bottom of the barrel where everybody's sort of competing against each other now. Mm. Um, uh, we can talk at length about that. Well, I do. I do want to get into it because I know that um, you know we're, our brains are getting beat yeah. out by Massachusetts and Georgia, yeah. and who have these incredible tax incentives that, or rebates or whatever you want to call yeah. them, that um, to entice these people in. And I do want to get into that. Yeah, but I, I, just to finish your question, sure. I, I would say that the scope of film commissions over the time, it, it was primarily about being that liaison. Now, as technology changes. It's getting very easier, a lot easier to bring productions in and have smaller crews and have smaller gear and go wherever you need. And so the level of the assistance that a film office can provide has changed as well. It's very digital now and and how we turn around location photos and build packages for them. And and, um, it's we we have to adapt. And uh, it's not just about film anymore. I mean, you have television and you have web series is is a huge yeah, component they're of what growing. I do. My you know, uh, web production is huge. So, as the technology changes, I think so. So does the scope of a film commission. So, what are we talking dollar wise? What, what what's the impact to our state of, of digital film, or digital slash film? Yeah, uh, 
I wish I had a definite answer for everything. All I can tell you is the productions that have touched the film office in some way. And being a state that doesn't have a gen- like a general statewide permitting process or anything, we don't require that. You, you could film here and leave and me not even know about it. Mm-hmm. And it happens all the time. So there's a lot of projects that I end up hearing about later on down the road. And most of the time, the larger projects will contact me just as a courtesy or they'll need something. So I track a lot of data in the film office, and it goes back to about 2005. But it's only those projects that have touched the film office in, mm-hmm. such, in, in such a way. I would say that on average, it's about $1.5 million that I see in expenditures from projects. We get small projects. We don't get big projects. So when you're comparing apples to apples, whether it's New Hampshire or Massachusetts, and they're getting the Hollywood films, mm-hmm. and they'll, they'll come out of a year in the $200 million range, yeah. and New Hampshire is one point five. It sort of makes you feel like, okay, well, New Hampshire is doing nothing. Well, that, that's not necessarily the case. And there, there's a lot of smaller independent projects that are coming here um, because, and again, this touches to incentives, many of the states that have the aggressive incentives are marketing to Hollywood. They're, they're really pushing sure. those projects. The smaller guy is kind of feeling left out of the picture a little bit. So they're looking to New Hampshire or other smaller states where they can come in and, and have some creative atmosphere in a small state and uh, still leave their mark as far as uh, uh, their expenditures. So I, I would gladly take, you know, ten one and a half million dollar projects as opposed to the one yeah. fifty million dollar project. Yeah. You know. So that's the kind of thing that we're trying to work towards. And and there's still that misconception that when, when you're talking about film offices and economic development with film, that it's strictly about theatrical film. And it's not. It's one of the biggest sectors of our industry here deals with either commercials or photo shoots. We have still photo shoots that happen all the time here in New Hampshire. Those run like a regular production. They come in with their grip trucks and lights and their producers and their crew and and they'll they'll shoot still photos for a, like a, magazines, a magazines or print time. ads or catalog shoots, that kind of thing. Mm. So there's this notion that oh we have a state government office that that's just catering to Hollywood. That's not the case. So we have we have production companies and creative agencies here in the state that do a lot of work, and um, and we're we're attracting the same type of production companies and creative agencies from out of state. So it's it's not just about Hollywood. I, I wish there was more Hollywood. I really do. Mm. Um, you know, it's it's tough when you know the only film. Hollywood film shot from beginning to end in New Hampshire is on Golden Pond, and that was almost 40 years ago. That's what we're still talking about. Right, right. You know, the residual effect of that film is still great. I mean, people are talking about it. It's sold out at the, at the play, up at it, the Winnie Playhouse exactly, right now. Exactly. It's hugely popular. Um, people come every year looking for those locations, Squam Lake. They call every year looking for it. So if one film can have that kind of residual effect 40 years later. Imagine if we had a couple more in there. So this leads me to the big question. I know we don't, we're not, your bureau is not driving for the big ones, but a few couple of years ago, I worked as background on Daddy's Home 2, which was down in Massachusetts. Yeah. And I kept thinking, man, this is right over the border. And I saw the truck, the number of people involved was just enormous. And um, the, the dollars that had to have gone into that state yeah. were, were in the millions. And I was thinking, wow, I don't ever see this in New Hampshire. Is it, is it because we're not, we don't have the incentives? We don't want to do the incentives? What's going on with our government? Maybe it's our politicians. or I, I don't know where that lies. Yeah. What's going on there? Well, the first Because one every 40 years, I didn't mean to interrupt, but you're no. right. One every 40 years is not a good record. It's, it's not a good record, you know? Um, and, and it's hard, actually, to just keep referring to that one film and try to convince people there, there's an active thing going on yeah you know 
Um, but to, the first answer to your question, I, I would say that the reason we don't have Hollywood productions here in the state is solely because we don't have an incentive. It, and I, I'm not getting yet into the into the weeds on the reasons why. I'm just saying that when Hollywood calls and they're looking to film, and it used to be, I'm looking for XYZ location. Can you help me out? And they would usually blanket a few states. We would all send our location packages. They would look over and say, oh, you know what? New Hampshire looks interesting. Let's, take a, let's do a scout there. Now I pick up the phone. Sony calls. And the first question from the producer is, what, what's your percentage? And if I say, we don't have a financial incentive, okay, thanks. That's it. That literally wow. is the conversation. That's so sad. That's pretty sad. Yeah, and, and, and there's no me trying to buffer that with other benefits. Like, oh, wait, wait, wait. Yeah. You got, you got we have 12 McDonald's. Else. You know, a decade ago, <laughs> I'll be honest, a decade ago, um, one of those conversations would be, well, New Hampshire doesn't have a sales or income tax. <coughs> Excuse me. And they would flinch. They'd be, well, that's kind of interesting. How can we make that work to our advantage, especially the sales tax? I would use that all the time. Now it doesn't matter because as a producer, I, I could go to any state that has an incentive, okay? And I could say, hey, we're going to shoot here. What about your sales tax? Here's a form. Fill it out. We'll waive you your sales tax. So productions can go to any state now. And that is part of their incentive package. They can get their sales tax waived. So being at a disadvantage for not having a film incentive and trying to push our economy, our, our structure here, is uh, difficult. You know? And so the answer clearly is we're going elsewhere. They don't care if we have beautiful mountains, lakes. Um, we could have fantastic people, communities that are into film. Uh, it doesn't matter. The question is, what's your percentage? And if you even try to get into that ball game and do something a little creative, because you can't go full send and say, hey, we're going to have a 25% tax credit, but we're going to do something kind of nifty, you know, they won't buy it. The industry does not want to relearn incentives. They know they can go to like 36 other states yeah. and get what they need in a phone call. And on that, that number, um, it's an interesting shift happening there. You know, five years ago, New Hampshire was one in six states that did not have a financial incentive for film. Now we're one in 16. So there are some states that are starting to rein that back. I don't know why, um, because the states that have them are very aggressive. They're very aggressive. But we, whether New Hampshire... Whether a film incentive is right for New Hampshire or not, I, I don't know. I don't have the answer to that because there's 400 people, 424 people in the state house that need to make that decision. Yeah. And do they not see the economic impact? Uh, what what prevents them from even bringing it up as a topic? It's it's hard, and I'll tell you that in my tenure there have been eight pieces of legislation that have dealt with film incentives in some way since 2013. Um, six of which, I believe, five or six, were actually tax credit bills. The rest were like study commissions to take a look at it, which would have been great to have that conversation. Um, and a separate sort of film fund, that was this year, uh, for incentivizing production. All have failed. And it's something that I've seen since 2013. It, the, the difficulty is it's very hard to make the argument of the benefit of film coming into your community and spending their money when you don't have a paper trail back to the coffers. And Massachusetts, you know, taxes on everything, you know. At least you have a paper trail. You can say this production spent this money on this, and you can see how much of that... That was a big fight last year, wasn't it? About fund. They were trying to decide whether or not to keep their incentive. and Exactly. The paper trail was was important yeah. because they proved the impact that, that they actually had by going in there. Now, I would contend, I argue, that a production that comes in, they spend their money in the community, and it filters back to the state indirectly. You know, there's, there's a crew person that might be able to afford buying the house. 
Okay, there's money back to the state on that. Um, these trucks come in. They have loads of gear and things like that. Gas, gas tax. Yeah, right. You know, That's things, not small. Things like that, not small. So there are these indirect ways to, to explain how this works. To get hard data, it's difficult. That's really hard. And um, Well, I the s- longer you go without a paper trail, the harder it is to, to prove it, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> exactly. The, and, and the other thing that's made this difficult is it takes education over time to get legislators on board with this. And... Massachusetts was successful because they had an outside organization. They had the Massachusetts Production Coalition that hammered at their legislators for years on this. New Hampshire has a two-year election cycle. So by the time we get into the first year and they start educating them about film, we're already looking at re-election. And we may lose seats. We may gain new people in there. We're starting the process over again. Same thing with the governor. You know, it's it's just this constant momentum that doesn't allow any moss to stick, mm-hmm. and we have to start fresh again. Um, you know, I, and I re- and I respect where our House Ways and Means who sees the, this bill. I, I see where they're coming from too. I I see their point that you know them giving out a tax credit is a potential loss of revenue for the state because it's going to a company and I've had to explain how this actually works you know it's uh, so is part of your job to go before these agencies if I get called for it yeah Yeah. if there's a bill that comes up and and there's something about film and tax credits you know they obviously want to know more so I get grilled on that which is fine I'm happy to do it Um, but I see a lot of misunderstanding on how it works and there's a misnomer when you say tax credit um, it's it's not a credit against any taxes that they pay while they're here. You know, they don't get a percentage of rooms and meals tax back or anything like that. It's a production company will come into a state. Um, say you have a, a 25% tax credit, and they spend a million dollars on location. You know, they're they're going to get a certificate back for if they can show in their audit that they've spent that money here they'll get a tax credit for $250,000. Now, the production company doesn't reside in New Hampshire, so they have no reason to file for a tax return in New Hampshire. So they'll they'll sell it to another company that does reside here, a utility company or another private company or, or whatever. Usually 75 cents on the dollar, let's say. They're selling the credit? They're selling the credit. So now it's not even a full two hundred fifty thousand dollars. It's 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 now, and that company that resides in New Hampshire can now use that to apply it to their their tax return at the end of the year. Um, does it decrease revenue in the state? Yeah, but I think the the, the cost of production offsets that. You know, I haven't heard anything about. So we're, we're I, I'm hearing a lot about how they think it's costing us revenue, but I don't hear anybody or at least you haven't brought up yet, anybody talking about the money that's coming in. All of it, you brought up initially about the restaurants, the hotels, the gasoline, the the, the utilities. That's all being spent here when they're, they're not spending that outside and then bringing something in. Yeah. Yeah. There has to be some positive cash flow. Yeah, every, uh, I always say that everything you can think of as far as business goes, has the potential to be used for a film production. You know, they gotta go to lumber yards, build their sets, forests for greenery, you know, you, the caterers, they gotta pay and get their food and their supplies. You know, so there's this there's this trickle down effect that happens with production. Um, and you can you can see where the money flows. You know, there's there's a story that goes around the film commissions where um, I think somebody locally, actually, had worked on a production a long time ago, like in the 80s. And they were, I think, upstate New York. And this was the time when we had the $2 bill. And the production paid all the businesses with $2 bills. And everybody was like, where are all these $2 bills come from? And they started to see it flow through the community. So there's a visual representation there of when a production comes in, 
where that money can go and how it spreads through the community. So there's there is an economic benefit to this, and I just I, you know I, I would love to give it a try. You know, I mean, craft something that sunsets you know quickly or whatever. But if we can get one or two projects in here. Um, just to get ourselves on the map again. Yeah, and, I, I uh, constantly. I'm on, on boards and not. I'm not a board member. I mean, I'm on sites for casting, and it's amazing what's happening down in Massachusetts. The TV shows that have come that are up. City on a Hill is a new one down there. They're yeah. doing. Smilf they're doing down there, and then they do the movies that that come up. And Adam Sandler's down there right now, casting for some new movie. Yeah. I just sit there, and of course, I got to drive to Massachusetts mm-hmm. and, and eat down there and pay gas down there to those folks if I want to. So it just seems, man, this is just, it's mind by, it makes me scratch my head. Just, yeah. I can't imagine what your job must be. I, to see this stuff just go by your window all the time. Oh, yeah. Good example of it. Um, I, back in 2013, I think it was, uh, Labor Day, a Paramount film with uh, Kate Winslet and Josh Brolin. It's a New Hampshire story written by a New Hampshire author, George Maynard. Okay, we tried to get that here. They ended up shooting in Massachusetts, all for like, except one scene. We got one quick scene. Um, they spent $13 million in the state of Massachusetts. Not here. Yeah, exactly. So the good thing about what Massachusetts is doing is that we're such a small, tight-knit region I have a lot of people from New Hampshire working on these projects. So as long as those big Hollywood films are coming to Massachusetts, we have people working on them. Would I love it in the backyard? Yeah, Mm -hmm. I'd love it right here. But um, we're small enough where we can kind of get around quickly and easily. And uh, we've got a number of crew that work on those projects. So what happened? What's going on daily at your at your bureau? What you show up in the morning? You're Answering machines blinking. You've got calls from somebody. What's going yeah. on during the day there? Usually, there are calls from uh, a producer or two that uh, um, are either already planning on filming here for whatever project. Typically, it's uh, you know like Discovery Channel or something like that. They're they're already slated to come here, and they want some assistance with maybe they want to film on a state park for a day, or they um, need to film on the side of a road somewhere and we need to do some permitting for for that or um, looking for specific locations while they're here. So it's it's a variety of different things. Every project is a little different. Um, It's it's always interesting where they could end up and what they're doing and um, whether or not you have to say no. You know, some of them would be kind of crazy. And uh, but um, sometimes there are crew referrals. They'll say, hey, we're coming in. We need a couple extra PAs to work on that. And um, so I look for production assistants, and I send a few names their way, um, and they get some work out of it for the day. Um, you keeping active rosters for that stuff? Yeah, I, I up do. To, very updated. Yeah. As long as we're on it, and folks who want to be on those lists, what would they have to do to contact um, you? They can either just go to the website and, and email me or call me, and uh, there's it's actually a, an online registration now, so you can sign up yourself and put your credits in. Upload your resume if you want. Nice. Um, so it, it, those, that resource is one of the, the primary things that uh, that producers will look for. Um, hey, we're coming to the state. Do you have a, a list of crew? I might need like a, another camera person type of thing. So then they'll go to that. Um, I'm in a position where I, I unfortunately can't recommend one individual because I mm-hmm. represent all of them. So and, you would just so give them the database I, itself? I, I give them, you know, if they're looking for assistant camera people, I'll give them assistant camera people. And I think the database um, spells out clearly if you look their, look at their resumes and their, and their credits who you should be talking to. Um, I mean, we have people at all different levels. And, and my goal is to try to get those people just starting out up on the next rung on the ladder um, and just kind of keep that, that building. Um, it's difficult now only because... Uh, we're, we're losing a lot of students that uh, are studying projects, you know, studying video and production, and they're leaving the state and going elsewhere because there's not a lot happening here. Another impact. It is. It is. It's another impact. It goes, it goes right down to even the, the impact of 
what schools are offering film and video production programs because people are spending money there, you know? And if there's not a lot of that activity, then the school won't offer the program and that kid is going to go elsewhere. So trying to reverse that, that's, that's the challenge. And uh, there are a lot of variables in this. And um, sometimes in my career here, it's, 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 people are very quick to boil it all down to why isn't Hollywood knocking? You know, why isn't this happening? We need to do, we need to do more. To bring, well, there's a lot of pieces to that. You know, um, one of the tricky things about incentive legislation is that usually there's a minimum spend requirement to be eligible to get that tax credit. Okay. Okay. Along with that is a certain number of hires, local hires. Say 50 percent of the crew has to be from that state. We're in a position now where we haven't had a film incentive for so long that we're losing people, okay? So if ever an incentive were to get on the books, who's going to come knocking? Hollywood's going to come knocking. What are Hollywood films? Hollywood films are union films. How many union crews do we have? I just going to ask you about the union stuff. Okay. So we have lost a lot of union crew to other states. And would that production be eligible anyway because the majority of the crew right now, if a, if a Hollywood film were to come to New Hampshire, the majority would come from Massachusetts. That's where the crew would come from. Sure, there would be probably 25% that would be from New Hampshire. But the majority of that crew is going to come from another state. Until such time that that, that reverses and New Hampshire becomes that hub and, and people flock back here. What, what I would really love to see if, if I could just, like, you know, wave a magic wand. I'd love to see New Hampshire become a place for, like, brick-and-mortar production companies. Like, they come here, whether it's, like, a post-production company. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, great. You're filming in Massachusetts, doing your thing, but there's an awesome editing company, you know, in New Hampshire, or special effects companies, or various television broadcasting equipment companies, or rentals, or things like that. Um, then you kind of start building that that infrastructure up, and then people come back. And, and so we don't even have that here at this we, point. We have I mean, we have some. We have some. Um, we've got a number of small production companies that are doing a lot of work. Um, we have a handful of visual effect companies. Um, we have one company down in Derry right now that is actually turning itself into studio space and equipment rental, which is, is really going to be handy since they're right on the, the I-93 corridor. So that'll be nice. But um, we have these various... You know, we've got about... If I were to open my directory today, uh, between companies and individuals, we probably have about 550 solid people that, you know, are here. Across the spectrum and, of across talents. Across the spectrum. Yeah, between production assistants to production of companies and editors and carpenters or what have you. So we have it. Um, we just need a couple of projects to to get that off the ground. I know that. Um, have you been down to that? Uh, for all intents and purposes, the Hollywood uh, studio mm. down in Fort Devens. Yeah, no, I, I have. They're not filming seen Castle Rock so down there right now. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. It's a Hollywood studio. Yeah. It's massive. Yeah. It's just, it's mind-boggling how big this thing is. Yeah. And fascinating to see it work. Um, that would be great to have up. I mean, oh, it yeah. seemed to me that we'd have plenty of places to put something like, I don't know what that would cost. I'm ignorant about that. But but it would seem to be some spillover from that kind of stuff. Again, to get to your point about editing and yeah. all of that, it'd be great if some of that could kind of spill over into New Hampshire. Yeah. Some of that work, it's terrible to have to keep it all down there. I keep talking with people that are that are looking to build studios, and this one in Derry that's coming together is going to be really nice. Um, if if I had my druthers, the, the guy asked me one day, you know, if you could have a set in here, what, what kind of a set would you want built that people could use on a, on a regular basis? And I have two. I, I would either want a kitchen set or a hospital set. I get... All sorts of calls. No kidding. For hospital rooms, for productions, for various industrial videos and 
short films and, and, and things like that. And they all, it's very difficult to get into a hospital to film. And so having like a set stage that could be maybe like a nurse's station in, in a room would go a long way, you know, for commercials and print and, and wow. things like that. Um, I never thought of that. Yeah, and it just goes back to that it's, 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 the money's just not coming out of Hollywood. So this, when someone like that approaches you, are they also looking for funding and saying, hey, is the state, is there anything out there that no, that's, to help? Or are they you know just... what? Those, that's usually a, a question from the really small up-and-coming filmmaker um, that is just kind of looking for any kind of resources. And, and, and you know, bless their hearts. I, I wish I had the funds to do something like that. There's not a lot out there. Um, what we have tried to do is support filmmakers. You know, there was, there was a, they still do it, but there was a craze a few years ago for crowdfunding. Yeah, you know, everybody was using Kickstarter platforms or Indiegogo or GoFundMe to raise money for their films. And the film office at one point actively tracked New Hampshire projects that were doing that and would promote it. Say, hey, let's support independent film here. Here's a person's campaign. And that, and that worked. And then that sort of died off now. You know, we don't see as much of that. Um, but there aren't a lot of funding resources in, in the state for film. You know, you're kind of going out of the loan. So we have to provide resources in other ways. We have to be able to, you know, I talk about state parks and permitting. We need to, like, streamline a process that allows these digital media companies to come and, and use our backdrop and uh, so people can see it elsewhere, Yeah, you know? Um, and it's state government, and it's a process. Uh, Usually it goes off without a hitch, depending on what agency you're working with. You know, I work with DOT all the time on uh, road permissions, whether somebody's filming on the side of a road or wants to close a road or, or something like that. They're fabulous over there. Fabulous. And as long as you have the answers to the questions and are asking the right questions when you go into it, you can plan properly and you can get it done. And there are a lot of filmmakers that come to my office very skeptical about permitting. The minute you start talking about permits, you are like, oh, I don't know if I want to get into that and raise red flags. And and what I do with filmmakers, you know, particularly with police departments, I usually tell indie filmmakers, like, contact this police department, you're going to be in town. Oh, God, I don't want to do that. You know, they're, I'm making a horror mo movie. What are they going to think? And so I try to reframe that for them. And I say, look, don't think of permitting as just like a bureaucratic process here. Think of it as instant marketing because what you're doing is you're going to an agency who knows nothing about your project and you're trying to get this done and in the process you're educating these people about what you do and what you're trying to, to build and, the, and if they help you with this they are automatically going to be interested in that end product they're going to want to see what they helped with so you could go back to them and say hey I came to you guys three months ago. I made this movie. Here's a copy of it for you. You know, Smart. or or, or the, the cop that had the cruiser who could do a drive through on our on our shot. Hey, here's a copy of the film. They show it to people. So it, permitting is more about education and, and marketing your project, in my opinion, than mm. than just a bureaucratic roadblock. So that's a lot of negative. <coughs> yeah. What's positive happening? What's going on? What, what is happening in the state? Do we have any TV? Do we have any projects that are ongoing? What, what, what's, what's the buzz down there at your bureau? Yeah, and I, I, I'll, I'm going to step back one. And when we talk about talking about the negative, the interesting thing here is there are positives that come out of that. And the biggest one I've seen over 17 years has been, with all the focus on the Hollywood films going elsewhere, the little guys have not gotten the attention they've wanted, so they've looked to me. And if we can carve out a nice little niche in independent film, I'll take it. So how's that come happening? Good, good. Talk about that. What? So an independent filmmaker wants to come. I mean, I, I do want to get into in a minute any connection you have with the New Hampshire Film Festival. That's coming up in October. Yeah. And it's ironic we have the New Hampshire Film Festival with no yeah. big films. <laughs> Yeah. So and so get into the independent part of it. What's the life of an independent going to look like when they come to you and they're, again, are they just looking for 
places to shoot? What yeah, you- they're looking for the basics. Uh, I think in general, independent filmmakers are looking for, and, and there's different levels of independent filmmaker. If you're talking like the really micro budget, I'm just doing this on a shoestring filmmaker, I think they're looking for validation. And if they can contact my office and I can say, you know what, I'll help you open a few doors. You know, if, if I can get you a contact, call this person, tell them you talk to the film office, that can go a long way. You know, let's grease some skids here and, and get things moving. Because a lot of times, New Hampshire is so underfilmed that if I were this young filmmaker coming up with a project and I go to another agency or organization and try to pitch them what I'm doing, you're going to get that deer in the headlights look. Okay. And they're going to be like, you're trying to do what on our property? What? So if they can then use me as sort of the grease that kind of helps that move forward, that agencies now go, oh, okay, well, he's con- the, he or she has contacted the state film office. At least they're trying to be on the up and up. You know, they're not trying to hide and be a guerrilla filmmaker running around. So, and I can vouch for that. I can say, you know, I I can't speak to how great the project's going to be, but I got this independent filmmaker who wants to come in and he wants to do this, and um, I think it's it's good for everybody involved. And more times than not, people will say yes. You know, there'll be an occasion where just given the logistics of what they're trying to do, you got to say no. You know, and I'm not afraid to tell people no either. If I get a filmmaker, my job is not just to be a yes man and say, yes, we want your project here, come film. Sometimes you just got to be like, no, we can't close down I-93 for two weeks. I, you know, it, it's not going to be possible. And, um, and and that's a big scale. That has happened. Really? Someone uh, asked you that? Oh, yeah, yeah. And um, that was a Hollywood film. That was way They wanted to shut down 93. Yeah, their, well, their request was they wanted a stretch of interstate highway that they could shut down for, for two weeks for shooting. And so they went to all the states, and they they came to me, and I was like, you know, I, I only have, like, three interstate highways here. I just, you know, there's not much I can do with that. But um, sometimes you got to tell the small guys no, too. If, if they're, if they're going to be running around, you know, with fake weapons and things like that, and you just got to be like, no, you, you can't be on this property doing that, especially if you're not going to be, you know, getting permissions from neighbors or things like that. There, there's a process to things. And what I hope to do is just have conversations with filmmakers and maybe tap into things that they weren't thinking about because they're, they're so tunnel visioned on their project. They've written their script. They're trying to get their movie made. And sometimes they don't see... The, the, the different pieces that can go into this that could ultimately help them as well. You know, I, I routinely tell filmmakers that when you're shooting in a community, contact the schools, let them know that you're doing something. And, and there may be a program at that school that deals with video production where those kids being able to shadow an independent film for a day would do wonders. Yeah, for them. that's really good. And I didn't so, thought about that. And then, again, what you've done is created community buy-in into your project. So there's this cyclical thing that happens when a production comes in, and, and businesses get impacted, but the community gets impacted as well, and, it, and everybody ends up working together on this. And when you have filmmakers that are really trying to delve into their creative process, they miss those opportunities. Uh, they miss those connections. So... I'm here to kind of take a step back and another 10,000 foot view of what they're doing. And Oh, here are some of the opportunities for, that can help your project and can help the community that you're trying to, to film in. Um, it's interesting because when I went to film school, I, I went to Keene State here for film and back in the early 90s and I wanted to be a, a writer-director. and had that creative spirit. Then I moved to Los Angeles and started working out there. Um, bounced around in commercial production for a little bit. I was with a, pro- a commercial production company for a couple of years. Then started bouncing around on various Hollywood films. And the last one that I worked on was The Time Machine with Guy Pierce. And I ended up working in the production office. 
and my friends were all working on the set. They're all like, oh yeah, we're we're doing things on set. I had a buddy from from Keene State who was working in the production office, so he kind of helped me get the end there. But it opened my eyes to another side of production that I wasn't aware of, having done the on set side. You know, now I was tight with the production manager, the producers, uh, the various like coordinators, like special effects coordinators and things like that getting an inside view and, and then I would have to go over to um, after production wrapped we had um, a big insurance claim that came down on the project that I had to stay on and so we got moved over to Amblin at the Universal Studios now if you know anything about me I love Spielberg I grew up on his stuff and that's what I wanted to be so being in his environment was amazing but I was doing it in a very different capacity than I thought. It was all about the the logistics side of it, the paperwork, the numbers, things like that. And I sort of carried that with me when I came back east. And working in a film office, to me, is just like working in that environment. It's, it's following paper trails and logistics and making sure everybody is set with what they need to do on the set. And um, so I kind of take that, that view. Yeah, you forget about those people. Yeah. When I was down there at Castle Rock working, I was just again just background. But you, it's not until you're you're on a set like that and you look around and you see the dozens, the dozens of people yeah. who never get seen, who are behind the scenes. There has to be for every one actor. There's probably five to ten people behind the scenes oh, yeah. doing stuff that you just can't even begin to imagine that so I, yeah. all these production assistants and all of that i mean this is just running around on their walkie talkies yeah and, uh, yeah you know it's a it's an army it, it is it, yeah. it's fascinating to see yeah you know and there's it's just it's handful of actors but those guys coiling wires there's guys that are just sitting oh, there yeah. facing five monitors there's people who handle the food make sure that everything that's all they do yep. it's their job that's their job food and if you if you vary from that one job and try to do a second job, you'll get called out on it. Isn't that true? Yeah. You know, it's like no, you're not here to move that light. That person is here to move that. Yeah. Light. You know, and it was it was a very fast. I did during the time machine. I did get a chance to spend some time on set, and just kind of observe what was going on. It's just amazing. It is amazing you know, to watch that all in motion. Yeah. And, um, it's funny too because we'll have projects come in. You know, I I, I was at Keene State when Jumaji came and filmed so I, I was able to watch that process and it was always fun so we had two films filmed here yeah but not in total <laughs> not in total okay. so yeah we've had a number of films that have been like you know various scenes and pieces but um, to watch the crowd come out and not understand that there's a lot of waiting in film you know and you know yeah. this and you know this it's it's you set up you set up, you do your take, and then there's another 20 minutes of... Easily. Reset. And Easily. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a lot of waiting. And and people would come out, and they would be impatient because they wanted to see a show, and it's it's not a show. Yeah. You know, this is this is production. Yeah, when we were working on Daddy's Home too, they had taken the Lawrence uh, Showtime Cinema um, area over. Yeah. And so they would put up all the extras in the different um, uh, theaters. Yeah. And so the first day you'd show up, there's like 300 people for extras. The next day there'd be like 175 because 125 would, didn't want to sit around waiting. Yeah. And you would, uh, you might only be on set for 20 minutes for the day, but you you were there for 10 hours. Right. You had to be on call. And 125, I'm like, no, I'm out of here. This is not. <laughs> this isn't cutting it. Yeah. But on the on the good side, to do that, they treat you well. Yeah. You can use for the most part your technology. You can use your phone and that kind of stuff, as long as you're not taking pictures and yeah. things that you shouldn't be. Um, uh, but they feed you all day long, mm -hmm. and then you you still have to have breaks. They they're written right into the contract. And so even though you're sitting there doing nothing, every two hours someone's coming by and saying, okay, it's lunchtime, it's break time, lunchtime, break time. It's pretty crazy what yeah. goes on, but you do have to wait a lot. You do. A lot. You do. So that, that's pretty much, you know, just being that extended resource. You know, I, tr I try to stress to 
productions that, um, especially newer filmmakers that, I'm not a free production assistant. You know, I get laundry lists a lot. Like, <laughs> hey, I, we're coming in and I need this, 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 this. And it's like, okay, well, here are the phone numbers to people that you need to call. I do that a lot with uh, film students. I, I think students need to understand the process of making some calls and sort of being able to pitch your project succinctly and, uh, and, and trying to get what you need. So I'll, I'll definitely give students phone numbers and say, here, you need to make the calls. I'm not doing this. You can drop my name if you want, but uh, you know, you're doing this on your own. Interesting, because I, I see a lot of stuff from BU, Emerson. Um, I don't see a lot from film students in New Hampshire. I don't know why. I, maybe I'm on the wrong, I'm in the wrong circles or something. But yeah. um, I know that there's a lot of student filming going on yeah. down in Boston. A ton of it. There's a ton. Yeah. There's a ton. What, what is there? Is it just because it's Boston? I mean, obviously, we do have people that are filming here. Yeah. Are they just getting lost in the noise? How come they're not more... The students? Yeah. You know, the student they're not more noticeable? Where are they posting all their stuff? Oh, it's all online. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, that's, that's the thing nowadays. And um, it's funny. They're, they're sometimes doing themselves a disservice because if they want to try to go the festival route, the minute you post your film online, a lot of these festivals are like, sorry, you've made it available online. We don't want to screen this. Man. You know, so, but that tool is available. Filmmakers now are just skipping festivals, and they're going straight to online. I mean, that's that's the thing. It's an interesting way to look at it, because you have to have some kind of, I mean, you just can't throw your film up there, can you, and, and assume two million views. It's not going to happen. It's, you it's, how you, it's how you market it, you know. It's how you market it. But those days of the 90s where you had to take your independent film and go shop it at a film market or an independent film or a festival, those days are gone, you know. that Nobody goes to a film festival now looking to buy, you know, your film mm-hmm. for distribution. I mean, and so filmmakers have become savvy. It's like, look, I, I don't... I don't necessarily, I would love a distribution deal, but I could put it on the internet now and market it myself and, and try to get it seen. So the, the game has really changed over the last 20 years, and uh, it'll change again. You know, We're walking around with our smartphones, and people are watching things right there on that yeah. screen. And, yeah. um, it's, very, it's a very different industry. I, I just hope... I'm a film purist myself. I, I love working with film. And I just hope that in this advanced age of digital technology, we don't lose sight, or students don't lose sight, on where that came from and how you create an image and how you piece together things to create a story. It's so easy now to take your digital cameras and just keep shooting and shooting and shooting and filming and, and cutting that stuff together where in my day, and here I am dating myself, going, in my day, <laughs> you, you had a roll of film, and you had to think about what you were going to do before you pulled that trigger, um, and hope to God it came back from the lab with something up there. And then you had to piece it all together and, yeah. and physically cut. There's a, physically there's, cut there's a them thing that Spielberg them. has talked about in articles in the past about how much, you know, he, he loves the digital technology and nonlinear editing, but physically editing, editing film. You know, it's, it's about, like, taking a moment and thinking about what you're doing before you use that razor, you know, and cutting a piece of film and then putting it back together with tape. You know, it gives you a slower process. Now everything's click, 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 click. And I fear that today's filmmakers... Are, are missing some of that, you know, they, that they're, they really need to go back to the basics of, like, how did this all evolve, and what did these filmmakers learn from the process, you know, um, having to load a camera, right. um, have it developed. Yeah, yeah have it film. developed, yeah. You know, I, I, that I, alone. I had two films, two student films when I was at Keene State. We cut the negative on our film. To get the final print, and that was unheard of. You don't touch your negative. You have somebody else deal with that. We would spend a weekend in 
you know, a room that we put sheets down to make it as clean as possible and cut, and every cut had to be like thought out and made sure it would match. And you make one mistake, and how do you repair this now? And, um, I, I think we've lost some of that with the digital technology and all the non-linear editing. So um, it's really nice that some filmmaker, young filmmakers today, are re-exploring like Super 8 film. You know, Super 8's making a comeback. I which, didn't know that. Which is great. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's making a comeback. Interesting. And they're picking up, you know. Kodak may have a second like They're yet. still producing it. <laughs> they're still producing cartridges. And you can go out and get your 50 feet of film and your three minutes. And and uh, they've, they've got new cameras now. And Super 8's a thing. And wow. I'm glad. Wow. I'm glad. Now they can just bring back VHS. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. I'll be happy. That's not happening. I'll be happy. <laughs> So how are you how is your bureau related to the film festivals? We have several, right? Yeah. We have SNOB. Yep. We have the New Hampshire Film Festival. How are you tied in with them? Um I do whatever promotion I can for them. I I try to provide some programming. The New Hampshire Film Festival in particular uh and Snob, I uh run a various meetup discussion or something. I provide something to the festivals. Snob Film Festival, I usually do a, a filmmaker meetup like on their Saturday morning so they can learn more about the film office and I can hear about their projects and just kind of network, that kind of thing. The film, uh, New Hampshire Film Festival in Portsmouth, try to do the same thing, whether it's an industry gathering or if it's a panel discussion. I try to provide some sort of programming. I don't do any film selections or anything like that. They usually do reach out to me and say, hey, look, we're just curious about if there's something on your radar in New Hampshire that was recently, you know, finished up and we should know about, or um, or I'll do the same thing with if there's a film that had just wrapped, and um, I'll give the festivals a heads up and say, hey, we have this project just wrapped. You might want to keep them on your radar. And, um, but I don't usually have a say in the selection process, and, and uh, I stay out of that. Um, the other film festival that's big right now is uh, the Monadnock. International Film Festival. I didn't know about yeah, that. Yeah, Monef. They've been running, I think they're year six now. Uh, they usually are in April. And they're in Keene. Um, they're, they're different. They're more of a curated film festival. They'll go out and they don't do a, like a submission process. They go out and they find their slate of films. And unlike Snob or New Hampshire Film Festival, they have a very linear schedule where it's one place for the weekend and your films are at different times as opposed to the having to choose what screen you're going to go to and yeah, see what at what right. time um, so it's a very different film festival um, but it's it's one of the big ones you know we have those three those three are the biggest and um, the New Hampshire Jewish Film Festival also which is like a month long festival that goes like weekends and things at various venues around the state that's that's very big too so those four so you basically just help them with publicity? Or? Yeah, I, I let people know that it's happening. If there's a call for entries, you know, I'll I'll let filmmakers know that hey, submissions are happening now. Um, and um, a lot of times I'll get calls from people from out of state looking for information on the festivals. You know, uh, film tourism is a big thing. Right now. I'll tell you, I, I the only one I've been to was the uh, New Hampshire Film Festival. Yeah, it's huge. Yeah, I mean swarms of people they, yeah. just, they shut down streets they, they just it's amazing to me the foot traffic that goes through there they've come a long way they really have are the, the, are the others similar yes uh, snob is a little smaller um, and I'm, I'm glad you know it's it's nice to have something local that's a little more grassroots yeah, they're through the Red River uh, right? they do Red River uh, sometimes they'll shake it up with other venues uh, but they've primarily been at Red River and um they do a really good job with sort of more underground film submissions and things like that. And, um, Monif, uh, Mananoc International Film Festival. Um, the films are usually more socially aware. Um, foreign films, things like that, uh, dealing with various social issues and, and topics. And um, it's they get a big draw. They do. Can, they do. Yeah, they get a they get a very nice draw. Why? Yeah, um, so those festivals are, it's, we're lucky to have them, have them here. Um, 
New Hampshire Film Festival does a thing on its first day called New Hampshire Day and Night, which focuses on New Hampshire made or any sort of a New Hampshire connection. So, like, if there's a producer, you know, we have a producer who is originally from New Hampshire who's out west a lot of times. He's bi-coastal, produces a lot of things out in Los Angeles. So um, they put a lot of his stuff in, you know, just to keep that New Hampshire connection in. Um, a lot of New Hampshire made shorts get into that program. Mm. So, but... Um, There's some crazy speakers out there, too. David Spade, I think, was out there just a, yeah, a year yeah. or two ago. See, they, they've really tapped into the film festival thing where you get, a, like, a headliner to come in. Yeah. And, um, uh, it's, it, and they have some great uh, boards, too. Yeah, you know, um, we can go in, in Q&As, yeah. you know. Uh, yeah, we, we've done that from time to time on various, like, filming in New Hampshire topics. You know, uh, we did one on film financing. We had some people out from Boston and um, grant organizations and things like that. And, and we've done another one on permitting process and, um, you know, various various things that whatever calls I get that year, you know, it's like, oh, this seems to be the, the frequent topic this year, you know, people are looking for. Do you... With the evolution of technology, are you finding more and more uh, questions about what can and can't be done? I'm thinking drones are now coming into play. Yeah. Um, we're getting AI into play in some of these things. Are you fielding more questions technology-wise, or is it still just a lot of paperwork stuff like, do I need a permit? Now, d- drones is a big one, um, and that's one that I really never have a good answer for because I don't think anybody knows yet what what the final word is on that. What I typically do with drones is send them over to our aeronautics division over at DOT that deals with drones. They're, they've got a better handle on, on what the FAA requires. And um, a lot of the folks that come in asking about drones are certified and things like that. So they've got a better handle on that. Uh, my rule of thumb is I don't, I don't need to know everything. <laughs> so if I know the people that do know everything, I send them. To there, I, I have a rule that I never keep a piece of paperwork on my computer if I can always get it somewhere else. So that's kind of the same thing with contacts. And it's like, if I don't know about drones, there's always somebody who will. So I'll send them over to them. I do know that our state parks has been developing policies on drones, too. I would think, um, yeah. White Mountain National Forest is very tricky when it comes to drone flying. And, um, it's not a privacy thing, right? Is it? Just, I don't think is it. No, it, it's more no. of a. We we have yet to see. There there was like a big battle, on s- the state front about drone usage and private use and all that and and privacy issues. Um, I'm still waiting for all those laws to shake down and, and see what's going to happen legislatively. But, um, you know, for the most part, m- my projects that come in are very set on like you know we want to film on at Odeorn Point or something like that over the seacoast and you want to fly a drone. Or, um, and, and usually it's okay. It's, uh, sometimes there are a lot of red flags that go up that really are unnecessary. You know, mm-hmm. I'm a filmmaker too. So I, when, when I see red tape pop up, I'm like, oh, geez, here we go. You know, we, don't, we didn't necessarily need to do it this way. But okay, mm-hmm. if we have to get it done, then, then we'll do it. But, so what are you looking at down the road? So you you've been here now, would you say fifteen years? And you're seventeen, yeah. 17? Okay, um, and I'm sure you you have to do like three, maybe five or ten year outlooks on things. What projects and stuff do you see that are coming down the road for the the New Hampshire Film Bureau that you're preparing for? Um, I get asked that question a lot, and I don't think I ever have a good answer for it. Uh, I know now that I'm in tourism. They're looking. They're 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 more. They have better practice in like strategic planning and things like that. And I know we're kind of looking at that and how the film bureau can fit into those those plans. For me, honestly, it's it's always been about customer service, and that's something that we really can't let go because that's really our only advantage right now. Um, we don't have financial incentives, but we do have an incentive of somebody at the film office who knows how to help you get your project made and connect you with the people who can also get that done. And I, word of mouth travels. 
you know, I'm sitting here with you today for a reason. And I, the same is true with filmmakers. They, they call me and they say, you know, so-and-so told me I needed to talk to you about this project. Can I, can I set up some time? And I'm very quick to tell them, how's next week? And they're, they're always, like, flabbergasted that they were able to get some, an hour with me and we'll just sit and talk and then the hour will come up and they'll have additional questions I'm like okay uh, let's talk some more you know I want you to walk away feeling like you know your next step and it's to me it's always been about that Um, the 1.5 million I get quizzed a lot on that a lot it's like how come it's just how come we're not doing more you know so that number is not 2 million or 3 million it's like that that to me is the end game you know, my, my goal is not to in, work to increase that money. I, I would have arguments probably in my department with people about that. But the philosophy behind film offices for me is not that I'm here to increase that, that revenue to the state. My goal is to provide the best customer service I can and showcase New Hampshire as a film-friendly state so that they will film here and spend their money here. Um, Because if they come in and they're spending their money and they leave feeling like they had a bad experience, they're not going to come back. Um, The last thing I want to have happen is them coming into a community like Peterborough. And when the production leaves, Peterborough feels, oh, we never want to help out again. Um, the, the opposite was true there. We had the sensation of sight, that film, the movie with David Strathairn, that filmed in 2005. And they filmed in Peterborough. And when they left, Peterborough felt like they wish they could just hold on to them. You know, it's like we had a restaurant that was closing for a season. And, you know, the revenue that they received from the production allowed them to stay open longer. And it kind of saved them for a few months. And the people in the town dealing with crew and stars, you just, you build this family. And by the time the project wraps, you don't want to see it go. That's what, that's the experience that we want to have in New Hampshire. I want filmmakers to come into New Hampshire and feel like they can put Los Angeles behind them and they can create and they can be here and they can roll their cameras without the pressures. You know, I I literally have arguments with filmmakers in Los Angeles who ask me about permits. And, no, no, I'll I'll put in a call to this person and get permission. Well, I need something on paper. No, you don't. Well, we need it in L.A. Well, that's L.A. (laughs) You know, you don't here. You have have a conversation and a handshake. Maybe you sign an agreement if it's a bigger organization that needs it. But it's, it's really easy. And that, the end result to me, will be shown in the, in the economic impact of that. Um, so you're basically, as we're, and this is going to wrap this up soon, unless you have a lot more to say, which I would love if you do. But, uh, um, you would say, so you do not proactively go out to try to attract business. I have and, no reason. I have no reason right now. Uh, you know, there's there's a, um, a locations expo that's held in Los Angeles every year where all the film offices are out there pushing their jurisdictions. I don't have anything that I can put up that says 25%. You know, it doesn't make sense for me to go out to that environment and try to push New Hampshire when all I get is, well, so-and-so is doing this. You know, 30% Louisiana, 25% Massachusetts. You know, what, what are you offering? A handshake. You know, that's... that's we have the White Mountains. We have the White Mountains. <laughs> we have these people. And, and that can only go so far. Yeah. That can only go so far. Um, so I don't, I don't actively do that. And I, I gave up a few years. Back in 2010, we had some budget cuts. And I was heavily into print ads at that time. And then I just stopped. And I got into social media. And I had a huge uptick in inquiries the following year. And people, magazines continued to call. Well, how come you don't do print ads anymore? I'm like, well, that's not what is connecting me to filmmakers now. You know, because all the print ads said the same thing. They were like, 
our financial incentives, if you our packages online. Social media, I could have conversations, you know, real live conversations, and, and I do this thing. Um, you know, I've been known over the years for doing what I call my meeting selfies. Any filmmaker comes into my office at the end of the meeting, I, I usually do a selfie. Chances are I'm probably going to do one with you by the time this is done. Uh, and what I've done is I've posted those. And I literally have filmmakers come to me now at the end of the meeting. If I have forgotten, they will remind me, hey, can we do a meeting selfie? Really? Yes, they want it. They want to be able to tell people that, hey, they went to the film office, we're working on this project. And they know that I'm going to tell people that, hey, I had two filmmakers in. They're working on developing a project for New Hampshire. Uh, film office is here to help however we can. That, That's marketing you can't you don't have to buy you know it's word of mouth it's customer service and I'll go on and on about customer service because I just think that um, you know I, I hear a lot about trade missions and, and uh, various conventions and expos and, and things like that and it's like that's you know right now for New Hampshire unless there was an incentive there's no reason for me to visit Universal and say hey here are the reasons why it's great to film in New Hampshire. You know, first of all, a lot of projects don't work that way anyway. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of projects in development right now that know exactly where they want to be. And so they're going to look at, well, where can we go to film and get the biggest bang for our buck? It's got nothing to do with, you know, I hear all the time about, oh, such and such film was about New Hampshire, so they really should have filmed in New Hampshire. It's like, well... Yeah, you know, but there's other projects too. You know, there's projects doubling for other projects in various states, and we'll take what we can get. So we don't always have to take the New Hampshire story uh, with the New Hampshire actor. And, you know, we don't need to do that. You know, let's get some commercial projects in here. We've had some fantastic commercial, like, national ads in here. You know, I get Jeep and Dodge doing photo shoots. Oh, is that time. right? Yeah. Yeah, they film all over our Lakes region and photo shoots and video shoots. And uh, we got some nice windy roads. And, yes, we do. You know, <laughs> things, we got a, we, we roads by the lakes and, and things like that. I get a lot of requests for roads. That's a big thing. That's interesting. Yeah, so I'm always out there. No, it's it's almost lunchtime, <laughs> but I'm happy to talk. So, no, no. So I, I was hoping you'd drop some names. So Jeep is good, um, and I'm really glad to hear that. Are, are there other are there other big name companies that love to come in here? And I mean, you uh, they don't have an open door policy, but you know, you you yeah. see them on a regular basis. Yeah, we usually see like catalogs like Orvis and. Uh, we had LL Bean for a while. Uh, I think they've since pulled back and done more in Maine. But um, a, a lot of the catalog shoots, it, it's an interesting story because I asked a couple producers a few years ago why they come to New Hampshire. And they said that, um, you know, we bring our company in and it's, it's money to move people around. So in the week that they're there, if you're in Concord, you go an hour in every direction and you're going to get a very different look. That's for sure. Mountains to the north, more farmlands, rural areas to the west, seacoast to the east, urban to the south. So they can accomplish a lot in those few days if they have to move around and get different scenics like that. Um, that's an advantage. That right there is an advantage because we have so many diverse locations in a short drive. Um, that's one of those things that I can push and... and people take notice. But it's more commercial production. It's more photo production. That kind of thing. And, and not necessarily feature film or television. Do you work with any of the uh, talent agencies as well? Or, or does that not... Not really. You? Uh, are you talking to New Hampshire talent agencies? Yeah, or? so let's say Hannaford or, yeah. or Shaw's or somebody wants to film. They're going to do commercials. Do they come to you at all? No, for? no they, they typically don't. Okay. They, they usually go to various casting agencies and, and things. And we have a couple in New Hampshire. But... Um, um, yeah, the, talent is usually something that that actually falls into a category. Like, I would refer productions to them. Like, I would refer 
um, the production to camera operators. You know, there's there's cat, casting and talent agencies. So I don't want to take on that role from them, mm. and uh, that's their job. So I'll post casting notices and things if there's a general blanket saying, hey, we're looking for 20 people for an upcoming shoot or something like that. Call this number or whatever. Yeah, I'll spread the word. Where do you post that? Uh, Twitter, Facebook, the usual, the usual channels. Um, and it's usually pretty well received. Okay. You know? and, uh, but yeah, I usually refer, if they're looking for something specific, I'll say, yeah, give, this, give New England Models Group in Manchester a call, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, oh. Yeah. So. so have we not covered anything? What? Oh, geez. You, I, I'm serious. I've got time. So, I mean, it's up to you. Whatever you'd like to chat about your agency. Is, is there anything that you do specifically that we didn't cover? And you're like, oh, I need to... Oh, I don't know. I just... Uh, you know what? I th- I think it all comes back to the incentive argument. I I know. I hate that. But. I, go, I go back and forth on it. Um, it's... I always say that if your project, if you really want to shoot in New Hampshire, shoot in New Hampshire. You know, it's if you feel like you need to take advantage of a financial incentive in another state, go to another state. You know, I just, I do think there'll be another attempt at some point to craft a bill. Um, and the last few bills, man, have just, in my opinion, have just been off track. They, they just have not addressed it correctly so but i don't write the legislation you know i just provide the information Um, i i always remind legislators when i'm testifying about this that they always ask well do you feel we need this or whatever i i am here to execute the policy that they create so if they feel that we need it all i can tell them is that we have lost business without having one uh, it's as simple as that. Um, whether New Hampshire is the place for a financial incentive, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, you know. Um, but uh, I can give you a list of more projects that have filmed elsewhere than projects that have filmed here. Um, projects that have knocked on your door. Projects that have knocked on my door, you know, they are filmed elsewhere. Are you alone in your office? How many people? Do you? Yeah, it's me. It is. That's me. So I'm talking to the whole department. You are. You are. That's the other thing. It's, you know, when people take meetings with me, they're surprised they can get a meeting. They're actually surprised that I'm picking up the phone. You know, they're, they've got the guy. And so they thought they were going to get some executive assistant or something like that. It's like, no, you're talking to me. What do you need? And uh, That's actually a very good point. Yeah. I, you know what? I... I go and I visit classes, video production classes, and I tell students all the time that it it doesn't matter whether you're a film student or if Steven Spielberg's calling. You're getting see I'm, that's my stomach that time. <laughs> it's almost lunchtime. Um, it, I'm going to treat the projects the same. You know this this idea that Hollywood's coming knocking. You got to just give them the key to the state. Yeah, it's not true. It's not true, but I'm going to give the level of assistance to an up-and-coming filmmaker as well uh, that I would give any studio film. You want location photos? I'll send you some. You know, I'll give you some pointers or uh, guidance on where to film, that kind of thing. But uh, it's it's strictly about relationship building. You know, it really is. And I'm hoping somebody listening to the podcast today will think, you know what, I hadn't thought about I'm doing a project, I'm, I hadn't thought about a film office. People think of state government as a roadblock. Mm, yeah, you know? right, right. And we have resources in our department, not just in film, but in tourism and in economic development. We're meant to help business along. And that's that's one of the primary reasons why I thought it was appropriate to move the film office into the department, is that uh, uh, you know, it, it mirrors everything that that department's trying to do. But at the same token, I mean, there's, you know, I came I came from a department that dealt a lot with arts and culture, and I focus on that with filmmakers too. It's it's not just about your the economic develop, development side of it. I I want you to make your art, and I I want people to see it. 
You know, uh, part of my story is telling the story of what is happening here. And if that film's not getting made, that's one less thing I can talk about. Right. You know, so I want to be able to tell our governor, our legislators, executive council, people out of state. These are the exciting things that are going on in our state. These are the people that are creating them. Um, because it's, you know, it's simply not just about Hollywood anymore. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Something very organic. Yeah. I think in the state. It's, they fly under the radar. It's a shame because we do think about the Hollywood stuff. They're the big gorilla, right? Yeah. But there is all this like subculture yeah. out there that needs to be tended to. Because in sooner or later, they are going to be the next big gorilla. Yep. And it would be nice to have that gorilla come home once if they, if they say, hey, when I was up and coming, New Hampshire really put out its hand. Yeah. Um, they'll come around. Yeah. You know? So, anyway, I hope I uh, helped give you a little oh. education. Oh, that's I was to, great. That's, that's perfect for me. I, 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 I learned a lot, as always, which is my goal. Yeah. To learn about these... these uh, little niche things that I have no idea are out there, but I'm fascinated by them. That's great. So, Anything else? No, I, I thank you for having me on. Uh, no, you're I, welcome. You're I, I told you, people were saying I, three or four times, get him in, get him in, get him in. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Reach out. Hey, thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. And there you go. Another great one in the tank. That one's going off to the memorial. Have a great day.